Part 1 has long been noted by intelligent people that happiness is like health. When it is present, you do not notice it. But when the years pass, how do you remember happiness? Oh, how do you remember? As for me, as it turned out now, I was happy in 1917, in the winter. An unforgettable, blizzard-like, impetuous year. The blizzard that started picked me up like a piece of torn newspaper and carried me from a remote area to a county town. It's a big thing, you think, a county town? But if someone, like me, sat in the snow in winter, in strict and poor forests in summer, for a year and a half, without leaving for a single day, if someone tore a parcel on a newspaper from last week with such a heartbeat, like a happy lover blue envelope, if someone went to childbirth for 18 miles in a sleigh drawn in single file, he, presumably, will understand me. The coziest thing is a kerosene lamp, but I'm for electricity. And now I saw them again, finally, seductive electric light bulbs. The main street of the town, well packed with peasant sleighs, a street on which, charming the eye, hung, a sign with boots, a golden pretzel, red flags, an image of a young man with piggy and impudent eyes and with an absolutely unnatural hairstyle, which meant that behind the glass doors there was a local basil, who for 30 kopecks undertook to shave you in every time, with the exception of festive days, with which my fatherland abounds. I still remember Basil's napkins with a shudder, napkins that made me relentlessly imagine at page in the German textbook of skin diseases, on which a solid shanker on the chin of some citizen is depicted with convincing clarity. But these napkins still won't darken my memories. A live policeman was standing at the intersection, iron sheets with tight rows of cakes with red cream were vaguely visible in the dusty window, hay covered the square, and they walked, and drove, and talked, yesterday's Moscow newspapers containing amazing news were sold in the booth, Two Moscow trains were whistling invitingly in the distance. In a word, it was civilization, Babylon, Nevsky Prospect. There is no need to talk about the hospital. It had a surgical department, therapeutic, infectious, obstetric. There was an operating room in the hospital, an autoclave shown in it, taps were silvered, tables opened their cunning paws, teeth, screws. The hospital had a senior doctor, three residents, except me, a paramedic, midwives, nurses, a pharmacy, and a laboratory. The laboratory, just think. With a Zeiss microscope, an excellent supply of paints. I shuddered and grew cold, I was pressed by impressions. Many days passed until I got used to the fact at the one-story buildings of the hospital in the December twilight, as if on command, lit up with electric light. He blinded me. The water raged and thundered in the baths, and dirty wooden thermometers dived and swam in them. Moans broke out all day in the children's infectious ward, thin, pitiful crying was heard, hoarse gurgling. Nurses ran, ran. A heavy burden has slipped from my soul. I no longer bore the fatal responsibility for everything that happened in the world. I was not to blame for the strangulated hernia and did not flinch when the sleigh arrived and brought a woman with a transverse position, I was not touched by purulent pleurisy that required surgery. For the first time, I felt like a person whose scope of responsibility is limited by some limits. Childbirth? Please, there is a low building, there is the extreme window, covered with white gauze. There's an obstetrician there, cute and fat, with a red mustache and balding. That's his business. Slay, turn to the window with gauze. Complicated fracture, chief surgeon. Pneumonia? To the therapeutic department, to Pavel Vladimirovich. Oh, the majestic machine of a large hospital on an adjusted, precisely lubricated course like a new screw according to a pre-taken measure, and I entered the machine and took the children's department. Both diphtheria and scarlet fever consumed me, took my days. But only days. I began to sleep at night, because I could no longer hear the ominous night knocking under my windows, 
which could lift me up and drag me into the darkness to danger and inevitability. In the evenings I began to read, about diphtheria and scarlet fever, of course, first of all, and then for some reason with a strange interest of Fenimore Cooper, and fully appreciated the lamp over the table, and the grey embers on the tray of the samovar, and the cooling tea, and sleep after a sleepless year and a half. So I was happy in the winter of the seventeenth year, having received a transfer to a county town from a remote blizzard site. Part 2 A month flew by, followed by the second and third, the seventeenth year departed, and February eighteenth flew. I got used to my new position and little by little I began to forget my distant section. A green lamp with hissing kerosene, loneliness, snowdrifts. Ungrateful. I forgot my combat post, where I alone, without any support, struggled with diseases, on my own, like the hero of Fenimore Cooper, getting out of the most outlandish situations. Occasionally, however, when I went to bed with a pleasant thought about how I would fall asleep now, some fragments flashed through my already darkening consciousness. A green light, a flashing lantern, the creak of a sleigh, a short moan, then darkness, the dull howl of a blizzard in the fields. Then it all tumbled sideways and failed. I wonder who is sitting there in my place now? Someone is sitting there. A young doctor like me, well, I've done my time. February, March, April, well, and, say, May, and the end of my experience. So, at the end of May, I will part with my brilliant city and return to Moscow. And if the revolution picks me up on its wing, I may have to travel some more, but, in any case, I will never see my sight again in my life. Never. Capital. Clinic. Asphalt. Lights. That's what I thought. But it's still good that I stayed at the site. I became a brave man. I'm not afraid. What have I not treated? Really? Eh? He did not treat mental illnesses. After all, right, no, let me. And the agronomist drank himself to hell then. And I treated him, and rather unsuccessfully. Delirium tremens. What is not a mental illness? I should read psychiatry. Come on, her, sometime later in Moscow. And now, first of all, children's diseases, and more children's diseases, and especially this hard labor children's recipe. Ugh, damn. If a child is ten years old, then, say, how many pyramids can he be given for an appointment? 0 0.1 or 0 0.15? Forgot. And if it's three years? Only childhood illnesses, and nothing more, quite mind-blowing accidents. Goodbye, my plot. And why does this section so persistently come into my head tonight? Green fire, after all, I'm done with him calculations for life. Well, that's enough. Sleep. Here's the letter. With an opportunity, brought. Give it here. The nurse was standing in my front room. A coat with a peeling collar was thrown over a white lab coat with a brand. The snow was melting on the cheap blue envelope. Are you on duty in the emergency room today? I asked, yawning. I am. Is there no one? No, it's empty. Eat. Yawning tore my mouth, and from this word I pronounced sloppily, someone will come, you let me know Shuda. I'm going to bed. Okay. Can I go? Yes, yes. Go ahead. She's gone. The door screeched, and I slapped my shoes into the bedroom, tearing the envelope with my fingers ugly and crooked on the way. It turned out to be an oblong, crumpled form with a blue stamp of my precinct, my hospital. An unforgettable form. I grinned. It's interesting. I've been thinking about the plot all evening, and now he came to remind me of himself. A premonition. A recipe was written in chemical pencil under the stamp. 
Latin words, illegible, crossed out. I don't understand anything, confusing recipe, I muttered and stared at the word, morphine. What's so extraordinary about this recipe? Oh, yes, a 4% solution. Who prescribes a 4% morphine solution? Why? I turned the paper over, and my yawn passed. On the back of the sheet, in ink, in a sluggish and dispersed handwriting, it was written. February 11, 1918 Dear Colega, Excuse me for writing on a piece of paper. There is no paper at hand. I got very seriously and badly ill. There is no one to help me, and I don't want to seek help from anyone but you. For the second month I have been sitting on your former site, I know that you are in the city and relatively close to me. In the name of our friendship and university years, I ask you to come to me as soon as possible. At least for a day. At least for an hour. And if you say, I'm hopeless, I'll believe you. Or maybe you can be saved. Yes, maybe you can still be saved. Will hope shine for me? I ask you not to tell anyone about the contents of this letter. Maria. Go to the emergency room right now and call the nurse on duty. What's her name? Well, I forgot, in a word, the attendant who brought me the letter now. Hurry up. Right now. A few minutes later, the nurse was standing in front of me, and the snow was melting on the peeling cat, which served as a material for the collar. Who brought the letter? I don't know. With a beard. He is a cooperator. He was on his way to town, he says. Um, well, go ahead. No, wait. Now I'm going to write a note to the chief doctor, take it, please, and return the answer to me. Okay. My note to the chief physician. February 13th, 1918. Dear Pavel Ilarionovich, I have just received a letter from my university friend Dr. Polyakov. He is sitting on my former Gorlovsky plot all alone. Apparently, he was seriously ill. I consider it my duty to go to him. If you allow me, tomorrow I will hand over the department to Dr. Radovich for one day and go to Polyakov. The man is helpless. Dear Dr. Baumgard, 3. Response note of the chief physician. Dear Vladimir Mihailovich, go. Petrov. I spent the evening working on a railway guidebook. It was possible to get to Gorlov in the following way. Tomorrow, leave at 2 o'clock in the afternoon with the Moscow mail train, travel 30 versts by rail, disembark at station N, and from there 22 versts drive by sleigh to the Gorolovskia hospital. With luck, I'll be in Gorolovo tomorrow night, I thought, lying in bed. What is he sick with? Typhus, pneumonia? Neither one nor the other, then he would have written simply, I got pneumonia. And then a chaotic, slightly fake letter. It's hard, and I got sick badly, with what? Syphilis? Yes, definitely syphilis. He's terrified, he's hiding, he's afraid. But what kind of horses, I wonder, will I ride from the station to Gorolovo? A bad number will come out as soon as you arrive at the station at dusk, and there will be nothing to get there. Well, no. I'll find a way. I'll find some horses at the station. Send a telegram for him to send the horses. No need. The telegram will arrive the day after my arrival. After all, she won't fly to Gorolovo by air. He will lie at the station until an accident happens. I know this, Gorolovo. Oh, bear corner. The letter on the letterhead lay on the night table in the circle of light from the lamp, and next to it stood the companion of irritable insomnia, with a stubble of cigarette butts, an ashtray. I tossed and turned on the crumpled sheet, and annoyance was born in my soul. The letter began to annoy. Really, if there's nothing acute, but, say, syphilis, then why doesn't he come here himself? 
Why should I rush through a blizzard to him? What, am I going to cure him of Louis in one evening, or what? Or from esophageal cancer? What kind of cancer is there? He's two years younger than me. He is 25 years old. Hard. Sarcoma? The letter is ridiculous, hysterical. A letter from which the recipient may get a migraine, and here it is. Tightens the vein on the temple. You'll wake up in the morning, which means that the vein will climb up on the crown, fetter half your head, and by the evening you'll be swallowing a pyramid with caffeine. And what is it like in a sleigh with a pyramid? It will be necessary to take a traveling fur coat from the paramedic, you will freeze tomorrow in your coat. What's wrong with him? Hope will shine, that's what they write in novels, and not at all in serious doctor's letters. Sleep, sleep. Don't think about it anymore. Everything will be clear tomorrow. Tomorrow. I turned on the light switch, and instantly the darkness ate up my room. Sleep, the vein is aching. But I have no right to be angry with a person for a ridiculous letter, not yet knowing what the matter is. A person suffers in his own way, so he writes to another. Well, as he can, as he understands. And it is unworthy, because of migraines, because of anxiety, to defame him at least mentally. Maybe it's not a fake or a romantic letter. I haven't seen him, Serio Zapolyakov, for two years, but I remember him perfectly. He was always a very reasonable person, yes. So, some kind of trouble has happened. And my vein is lighter. Apparently, the dream is coming. What is the mechanism of sleep? I read in physiology, but the story is dark. I don't understand what sleep means, how do brain cells fall asleep? I don't understand, I'm telling you in confidence. Yes, for some reason I am sure that the compiler of physiology himself is also not very firmly sure. One theory is worth another. There is an earring of poles in a green jacket with gold buttons over a zinc table, and on the table is a corpse. Hmm, yes, well, it's a dream. Part 3 Knock, knock Boom, 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 yeah Who? Who? What? Ah, uh, knocking, ah, uh, damn, knocking Where am I? What am I? What's the matter? Yes, in my bed Why am I being woken up? They have the right because I am on duty Wake up Dr. Baumgard. There's Maria padding to the door to open it. What time is it? Half past one. Night. So I slept for only one hour. How's the migraine? It is obvious. Here she is. There was a soft knock on the door. What's the matter? I opened the door to the dining room a crack. The nurse's face looked at me out of the darkness, and I saw at once that it was pale, that her eyes were dilated, agitated. Who was brought? Doctors from the Gorlovsky district, the nurse answered hoarsely and loudly, the doctor shot himself. In Lakeove? It can't be. Polyakov? I do not know the last name. That's what, now, I'm coming. And you run to the head doctor, wake him up this second. Tell him I'm calling him to the emergency room urgently. The nurse started, and the white spot disappeared from her eyes. Two minutes later, an angry blizzard, dry and prickly, slapped my cheeks on the porch, puffed up the skirts of my coat, froze my frightened body. A white and restless light was blazing in the windows of the emergency room. On the porch, in a cloud of snow, I ran into a senior doctor who was striving to go the same way as me. Yours? Poles? The surgeon asked, coughing. I don't understand anything. Obviously, he is, I replied, and we quickly entered the rest. A muffled woman rose from the bench to meet him. 
familiar eyes looked at me tearfully from under the edge of a brown handkerchief. I recognized Maria Vlasievna, a midwife from Gorlov, my faithful assistant during childbirth in the Gorolovo Hospital. Poles? I asked. Yes, replied Maria Vlasievna, such a horror, doctor, I was driving, trembling all the way, just to take. When? This morning, at dawn, muttered Maria Vlasievna, the watchman came running, saying, the doctor has a shot in the apartment. Dr. Polyakov was lying under the lamp, pouring out a nasty disturbing light, and from the first glance at his lifeless, like stone, feet of felt boots, my heart habitually skipped a beat. His hat was removed from him, and his clumped, wet hair appeared. My hands, the nurse's hands, Maria Vlasievna's hands flashed over Polyakov, and a white gauze with blurring yellow-red spots came out from under the coat. His chest was rising weakly. I felt my pulse and trembled, the pulse disappeared under my fingers, stretched and broke into a thread with knots, frequent and fragile. The surgeon's hand was already reaching out to the shoulder, taking the pale body in a pinch on the shoulder to inject camphor. Here the wounded man glued his lips and a pinkish bloody stripe appeared on them, slightly moved his blue lips and dryly, weakly pronounced. Drop the camphor. To hell with it. Be silent, the surgeon answered him and pushed the yellow oil under the skin. The heart bag must have been touched, whispered Maria Vlasievna, tenaciously took hold of the edge of the table and began to peer into the endless eyelids of the wounded man, his eyes were closed. The shadows, grey violet, like the shadows of sunset, began to bloom more and more brightly in the recesses near the wings of the nose, and fine, like mercury, Sweat stood out like dew on the shadows. A revolver? The surgeon asked, twitching his cheek. Browning, stammered, Maria Vlasievna. Eh, eh, the surgeon said suddenly, as if angry and annoyed, and suddenly, waving his hand, walked away. I turned to him in fright, not understanding. Someone else's eyes flashed over his shoulder. Another doctor came up. Polyakov suddenly moved his mouth, crookedly, like a sleepy one, when he wants to drive away a sticky fly, and then his lower jaw began to move, as if he was choking on a lump and wanted to swallow it. Ah, to anyone who has seen nasty revolver or rifle wounds, this movement is well known. Maria Vlasievna winced painfully and sighed. Dr. Baumgard, Polyakov said faintly. I'm here, I whispered and my voice sounded softly at his very lips. Polyakov responded hoarsely and even more weakly. Then he opened his eyes and raised them to the joyless, dark ceiling of peace. As if the dark pupils began to fill with light from within, the white of the eyes became transparent, bluish. The eyes stopped at the height, then clouded and lost this fleeting beauty. Dr. Polyakov is dead. Underscore 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 Night Near dawn The lamp is burning very clearly because the town is sleeping and there is a lot of electric current Everything is silent and Polyakov's body is in the chapel Night An open envelope and a piece of paper lie on the table in front of the eyes inflamed from reading It says Dear comrade, I won't wait for you. I changed my mind about being treated. It's hopeless. And I don't want to suffer anymore either. I've tried enough. I warn others, be careful with white crystals that are soluble in 25 parts of water. I trusted them too much and they ruined me. I'm giving you my diary. You have always seemed to me to be an inquisitive person and a lover of human documents. If you are interested, read my medical history. Goodbye. Your S. Polyakov. Postscript in large letters. I ask you not to blame anyone for my death. Dr. Sergei Polyakov. February 13, 1918 inch. Next to the suicide letter is a notebook of the type of common notebooks in black oilcloth, 4. 
the first half of the pages are torn out of it. In the remaining half there are brief notes, at the beginning with a pencil or ink, in a clear small handwriting, at the end of the notebook with a chemical pencil and a thick red pencil, careless handwriting, jumping handwriting and with many abbreviated words. Part 4 Year 17, January 20th And very glad And thank God, the further, the better I can't see people, and I won't see any people here except sick peasants But they won't touch my wounds, will they? Others, however, were no worse than mine on the land plots My entire issue, which was not subject to conscription for war Militia soldiers of the second class of the 1916 issue was placed in the Zemstvos. However, no one is interested in this. I learned about Ivanov and Baumgard only from my friends. Ivanov chose the Arkhangelsk province, a matter of taste, and Baumgard, as the paramedic said, is located in such a remote area as mine, three districts away from me, in Gorolovo. I wanted to write to him but changed my mind. I don't want to see or hear people. January 21st. Snowstorm. Nothing. January 25th. What a clear sunset. Migraine is a compound of caffeine antipyrin and citric acid. In powders of 1.0, is it possible for 1.0? Can. February 3rd. Today, I received last week's newspapers. I haven't read it, but I was drawn to see the theater department anyway. Ida was on last week. So she went out on the platform and sang, My dear friend, come to me. She has an extraordinary voice, and how strange that a clear, loud voice is given to a dark soul. There is a gap here, two or three pages are torn out. Of course, this is unworthy, Dr. Polyakov. Yes, and also, it's stupid to attack a woman with a foul language for leaving. She doesn't want to live, she's gone. And the end. How simple it really is. The opera singer got together with a young doctor, lived for a year and left. Kill her? Kill me. Oh, how stupid, empty everything is. Hopeless. I don't want to think. I don't want. February 11th. All these blizzards, yes, blizzards. It's taking me with it. I'm alone all night, alone. I light the lamp and sit down. I still see people during the day. But I work mechanically. I'm used to this job. She's not as scary as I thought before. However, the hospital helped me a lot during the war. After all, I didn't come here illiterate at all. Today I performed a rotation operation for the first time. So, three people are buried here under the snow, me, Anna Kirilovna, a paramedic midwife and a paramedic. The paramedic is married. They, paramedics. Staff live in the wing. And I'm alone. February 15th. An interesting thing happened last night. I was about to go to bed when suddenly I started having abdominal pains. But what? Cold sweat broke out on my forehead. After all, our medicine is a dubious science, I must say. Why does a person who has absolutely no stomach or intestinal diseases, for example, appendicitis, who has a beautiful liver and kidneys, whose intestines function perfectly normally, may have such pains at night that he will toss and turn in bed. With a groan, he reached the kitchen, where the cook spends the night with her husband Vlas. Vlas was sent to Anna Kirilovna. That night she came to me and had to inject me with morphine, 5. He says I was completely green. Why? I don't like our paramedic unsociable, and Anna Kirilovna is a very pleasant and developed person. I wonder how an old woman can live all alone in this snow-covered coffin. 
Her husband is in German captivity. I cannot but praise the one who first extracted morphine from poppy heads. A true benefactor of humanity. The pain stopped seven minutes after the injection. Interestingly, the pain was a full wave, without giving any pauses, so I was positively suffocating, as if a red-hot crowbar was stuck in my stomach and rotated. About four minutes after the injection, I began to distinguish between wave-like pain. It would be very good if the doctor had the opportunity to test many medications on himself. He would have a completely different understanding of their actions. After the injection, for the first time in recent months, I slept deeply and well, without thoughts about my own, who deceived me. February 16th. Today, Anna Kirilovna asked at the reception how I was feeling and said that for the first time she saw me not frowning. Am I gloomy? Very much, she replied with conviction and added that she was amazed that I was always silent. That's the kind of person I am. But that's a lie. I was a very cheerful person before my family drama. Twilight comes early. I'm alone in the apartment. In the evening, the pain came, but not strong, like the shadow of yesterday's pain, somewhere behind the chest bone. Fearing a repeat of yesterday's seizure, I injected myself with one centigram into my thigh. The pain stopped almost instantly. It's good that Anna Kirilovna left the bottle. 18th. For injections is not scary. February 25th. This Anna Kirilovna is an eccentric. Exactly, I'm not a doctor. One half syringe equals 0.015 morph. Yes. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. March 1st. Dr. Polyakov, be careful. Rubbish. Underscore, 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 underscore. Twilight. But for half a month, I have never thought about the woman who deceived me. The motive from her party at Amneris has left me. I'm very proud of it. I'm a man. Underscore, 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 underscore. Anna K. She became my secret wife. There could be no other way. We are chained to a desert island. Underscore, 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 underscore. The snow has changed. It seems to have become more gray. There are no more severe frosts, but snowstorms resume from time to time. Underscore, 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 underscore. The first minute, the feeling of touching the neck. This touch becomes warm and expands. In the second minute, a cold wave suddenly passes in the pit of the stomach, and after that an extraordinary clarification of thoughts and an explosion of efficiency begins. Absolutely, all unpleasant sensations stop. This is the highest point of manifestation of a person's spiritual power. And if I wasn't spoiled by medical education, would say that a normal person can only work after an injection of morphine. In fact, where the hell is a man fit if the slightest neuralgia can completely knock him out of the saddle? Anna K. is afraid. I reassured her by saying that since childhood I had been distinguished by the greatest willpower. 2nd of March. Rumors of something grandiose. It was as if Nicholas II had been overthrown. I go to bed very early. About 9 o'clock. And I'm sleeping sweetly. 10th of March. There is a revolution going on there. The day has become longer, and the twilight seems a little bluer. I've never had such dreams at dawn before. These are double dreams. And the main one, I would say, is glass. It is transparent. So, here, I see a terribly illuminated ramp, a multicolored ribbon of lights escapes from it. Amneris, waving a green feather, sings. The orchestra, 
completely unearthly, is unusually full-sounding. However, I can't put it into words. In a word, in a normal dream, the music is silent. In a normal one? Another question is which dream is more normal? However, I'm joking, it is soundless, but in my dream it is heard absolutely heavenly. And most importantly, I can amplify or weaken the music at will. I remember that in War and Peace, it is described how Petya Rostov experienced the same state in a half-sleep. Leo Tolstoy is a wonderful writer. Now about transparency, so, through the rainbow colors of Ida, you can hear the edge of my desk, visible from the office door, the lamp, the glossy floor and clear steps, pleasantly stepping like deaf castanets, breaking through the wave of the Bolshoi Theater Orchestra. So, at 8 o'clock Anna K comes to wake me up and tell me what's going on in the waiting room. She doesn't understand that I don't need to be woken up, that I hear everything and can talk to her. And yesterday, I did such an experience. A-N-N-A, Sergei Vasilyevic. Yeah. I hear. Softly to the music, stronger. Music is a great chord. Resharpen. A-N-N-A, 20 people were recorded. A-M-N-E-R-I-S, sings. However, this cannot be conveyed on paper. Are these dreams harmful? Oh no. After them, I get up strong and cheerful. And I work well. I even got an interest that I didn't have before. And no wonder, all my thoughts were focused on my ex-wife. And now, I'm calm. I'm calm. March 19th. At night, I quarreled with Anna Kay. I will not prepare the solution anymore. I began to persuade her. Nonsense, Anusia. Am I small or something? I won't. You're going to die. Well, as you wish. Understand that my chest hurts. Get treated. Where? Go on vacation. Morphine is not treated. Then, she thought about it and added. I can't forgive myself for making you a second bottle then. Am I a morphine addict or something? Yes, you're becoming a morphine addict. So you're not going? No. Here, for the first time, I discovered in myself the unpleasant ability to get angry and, most importantly, to shout at people when I'm wrong. However, this does not happen immediately. I went into the bedroom. I looked. There was a small splash at the bottom of the bottle. I filled the syringe, it turned out to be a quarter of a syringe. He dropped the syringe, almost broke it and trembled himself. Carefully lifted, examined, not a single crack. I sat in the bedroom for about 20 minutes. I go out, she's not there. Gone. Imagine, I couldn't stand it, I went to her. I knocked on the lighted window in her wing. She went out, wrapped in a shawl, on the porch. The night is quiet, quiet. The snow was weakening. Somewhere far away in the sky, it pulls in spring. Anna Kirilovna, please give me the keys to the pharmacy. She whispered. I won't. Comrade, please give me the keys to the pharmacy. I'm telling you as a doctor. I see in the twilight that her face has changed, has become very white, and her eyes have deepened, sunken, blackened. And she answered in a voice that awakened pity in my soul. But then the anger came back to me. She. Why, why do you say that? Ah, uh, Sergei Vasilyevich, I'm sorry for you. Nonsense. This record is nonsense. Not so scary. Sooner or later, I'll quit. And now, to sleep, to sleep. By this stupid struggle with morphine, I only torment and weaken myself. Then there are about two dozen pages cut out in the notebook. Rhea. I vomit at four hours. 
30 minutes. When I feel better, I will write down my terrible impressions. November 14, 1917. So, after escaping from Moscow, from the hospital, six, of the doctor. The surname is carefully crossed out, I'm home again. The rain pours a veil and hides the world from me. And let him hide it from me. I don't need him, just like no one needs me in the world. I survived the shooting and the coup in the hospital, seven. But the idea to give up this treatment was ripe for me even before the fight on the streets of Moscow. Thanks to morphine for making me brave. I'm not afraid of any shooting. And what in general can frighten a person who thinks only about one thing, about wonderful, divine crystals. When a paramedic, completely terrorized by cannon thumping. The page is torn out here. I tore out this page so that no one would read the shameful description of how a man with a diploma ran thievishly and cowardly and stole his own suit. What a costume. I brought a hospital shirt. It wasn't up to that. The next day, after giving the injection, he revived and returned to drive in. He met me pityingly, but through this pity there was still contempt. And it's in vain. After all, he is a psychiatrist and should understand that I am not always in control of myself. I'm sick. Why despise me? I returned the hospital gown. He said, Thank you, and added, What are you going to do now? I said briskly, I was in a state of euphoria at that moment. I decided to return to my wilderness, especially since my vacation has expired. I am very grateful to you for your help, I feel much better. I will continue to be treated at home. He answered like this. You don't feel any better. It's really funny to me that you're saying this to me. After all, one look at your pupils is enough. Well, who are you telling? I, Professor, can't get out of the habit right away, especially now that all these events are taking place. I was completely harassed by the shooting. It's over. Here is the new power. Lie down again. Then I remembered everything, the cold corridors, the empty, oil-painted walls, and I was crawling like a dog with a broken leg, waiting for something. What? A hot bath? A 0.005 morphine injection. Doses, from which, however, they do not die but only, and all the longing remains, lies as a burden, as it lay. Empty nights, the shirt I tore on myself, begging to be let out? No. No. They invented morphine, pulled it out of the dried clicking heads of the divine plant, well, find a way to treat it without suffering. I shook my head, stubbornly. Then he got up, and I suddenly rushed to the door in fright. It seemed to me that he wanted to lock the door behind me and keep me in the hospital by force. The professor turned purple. I'm not a prison guard, he said, not without irritation, and I don't have bottles. Sit still. You boasted that you were perfectly normal two weeks ago. And meanwhile, he emphatically repeated my gesture of fright, I'm not holding you, sir. Professor, give me back my receipt. I beg you, and even my voice trembled pityingly. Please. He clicked the key in the desk and gave me my receipt, that I undertake to undergo the entire two-month course of treatment and that I may be detained in a hospital, etc., in a word, the usual type. With a trembling hand, I took the note and hid it, stammering. Thank you. Then, he got up to leave. And he went. Dr. Polyakov. I heard after me. I turned around, holding on to the door handle. Here's what, he said, come to your senses. Understand that you will still end up in a psychiatric hospital, well, a little later. And besides, you will end up in a much worse condition. I still considered you as a doctor. And then you will come already in a state of complete mental collapse. You, my dear fellow, in fact, 
cannot practice and, perhaps, it is criminal not to warn your place of service. I shuddered and clearly felt that the color had gone from my face, although I have very little of it anyway. I, I said dully, I beg you, professor, not to say anything to anyone. Well, they'll remove me from the service, they'll call me sick, why do you want to do this to me? Go, he shouted irritably, go. I won't say anything. They will return you anyway. I left and, I swear, I was twitching with pain and shame all the way. Why? Very simple. Ah, my friend, my faithful diary. You won't betray me, will you? It's not the suit, but the fact that I stole morphine in the hospital. Three cubes in crystals and 10 grams of 1% solution. I am interested not only in this, but also in this. The key was in the closet. Well, what if it wasn't? Would I have broken into the closet or not? In good faith? I would have hacked it. So, Dr. Polyakov is a thief. I'll have time to tear out the page. Well, about the practice, he still overdid it. Yes, I am a degenerate. That's right. My moral personality has begun to disintegrate. But I can work, I can't do any harm or harm to any of my patients. Yes, why did you steal it? Very simple. I decided that during the fighting and all the turmoil associated with the coup, I would not get morphine anywhere. But when it subsided, I got 15 grams of 1% solution from another pharmacy on the outskirts, a useless and tedious thing for me, nine syringes will have to be injected. And I still had to humiliate myself. The pharmacist demanded a seal, looked at me frowningly and suspiciously. But the next day, when I got back to normal, I received 20 grams in crystals without any delay at another pharmacy, I wrote a prescription for the hospital, Along the way, of course, I prescribed caffeine and aspirin. After all, why should I hide, be afraid? Is it really written on my forehead that I am a morphine addict? Who cares, after all? And is the decay great? I bring these records to witness. They're sketchy, but I'm not a writer. Are there any crazy thoughts in them? In my opinion, I am thinking quite sensibly. A morphine addict has one happiness that no one can take away from him, the ability to spend his life completely alone. And loneliness is important, significant thoughts, it is contemplation, calmness, wisdom. The night is flowing, black and silent. Somewhere there is a bare forest, behind it a river, cold, autumn. Far, far away, disheveled, violent Moscow. I don't care about anything. I don't need anything, and I'm not drawn anywhere. Burn, fire, in my lamp, burn quietly, I want to rest after Moscow adventures, I want to forget them. And I forgot. Forgot. November 18th. Freezing. It's dried up. I went out to walk along the path to the river, because I almost never breathe air. The disintegration of the personality is a disintegration but still I make attempts to refrain from it. For example, I did not inject this morning, now I inject three syringes of a 4% solution three times a day. Inconvenient. I feel sorry for Anna. Every new percentage kills her. I'm sorry. Ah, what a man. Yes, so, that's, when it got bad, I decided to suffer after all, let Professor N admire me, and delay the injection and went to the river. What a desert. Not a sound, not a rustle. There is no twilight yet, but they are hiding somewhere and crawling through swamps, over hummocks, between stumps, they go, they go to the Levkovsky hospital. And I'm crawling, leaning on a stick, to tell the truth, I've been getting a little weak lately. And now I see, an old woman with yellow hair is flying towards me from the river down the slope, and her legs are not touching a bell under her colorful skirt. 
At first, I didn't understand her and wasn't even scared. An old lady is like an old lady. It's strange. Why is an old lady with no hair in the cold wearing only a blouse? And then, where's the old lady from? Which one? Our reception in Levkov will end, the last peasant slaves will leave, and there will be no one around for ten versts. Fogs, swamps, forests. And then suddenly a cold sweat flowed down my back, I got it. The old lady does not run, but rather flies, without touching the ground. Okay? But it wasn't that that made me scream, but the fact that the old lady had a pitchfork in her hands. Why was I so scared? Why? I fell to one knee, stretching out my arms, closing myself so as not to see her, then turned around and, hobbling, ran to the house as to a place of salvation, wishing nothing but that my heart would not break, that I would run into warm rooms sooner, see Anna alive, and morphine. And I came running. Nonsense. An empty hallucination. An accidental hallucination. November 19th. Vomiting. This is bad. My night conversation with Anna on the 21st. A-N-N-A dot the paramedic knows. Me really? Anyway. It's nothing. A-N-N-A. If you don't leave here for the city, I'll strangle myself. Do you hear? Look at your hands, look. I'm a little shaky. It doesn't stop me from working at all. A-N-N-A, look at them, they're transparent. One bone and skin. Look at your face. Listen, Serioza. Go away, I implore you, go away. Me. And you? A-N-N-A. Go away. Go away. You're dying. Me. Well, that's a strong word. But I really don't understand myself. Why did I weaken so quickly? After all, I have been ill for less than a year. Apparently, I have such a constitution. A-N-N-A, sadly. What can bring you back to life? Maybe this amnuris of yours is your wife? I... Oh, no. Calm down. Thanks to morphine, he got rid of it. Morphine instead. A-N-N-A. Oh, my God, what should I do? I thought that only in novels there are people like this Anna. And if I ever get better, I'll join my fate with her forever. Let him not return from Germany. December 27th. It's been a long time since I picked up a notebook. I'm wrapped up, the horses are waiting. Baumgard left the Gorlovsky site, and I was sent to replace him. A female doctor came to my site. Anna is here, will come to me. At least 30 versts. We decided firmly that from January 1st I will take a one-month vacation due to illness and to a professor in Moscow. Again I will give a subscription, and for a month I will suffer in human torment in his hospital. Goodbye, Levkovo. Anna, goodbye. 1918 year. January. I didn't go. I can't part with my crystal soluble god. During the treatment, I will die. And more and more often the thought comes to me that I don't need to be treated. January 15th. Vomiting in the morning. Three syringes of 4% solution at dusk. Three syringes of a 4% solution at night. January 16th. It's an operating day, so a lot of abstinence, from night to 6 p.m. At dusk, the most terrible time, already in the apartment, I heard clearly a voice, monotonous and threatening, which repeated. Sergei Vasilyevich. Sergei Vasilyevich. After injection, everything went right away. January 17th. Blizzard, no reception. 
I read a textbook of psychiatry during abstinence, and it made a terrifying impression on me. I am lost, there is no hope. I'm afraid of noises, people are hateful to me during abstinence. I'm afraid of them. During euphoria, I love them all, but I prefer solitude. You need to be careful here, there is a paramedic and two midwives. You need to be very careful not to give yourself away. I've become experienced and I won't give it away. No one will know as long as I have a supply of morphine. I prepare the solutions myself or send Anna a recipe in advance. Once she made an attempt, ridiculous, to replace the 5% with 2%. She brought him from Levkov to the cold and blizzard. And because of that, we had a hard fight at night. Convinced her not to do it. I informed the staff here that I was ill. I've been racking my head for a long time, what kind of disease to come up with. He said I had rheumatism in my legs and severe neurasthenia. They have been warned that I am going on vacation to Moscow in February to be treated. Things are going smoothly. There are no failures in the work. I avoid operating on the days when I have uncontrollable vomiting with hiccups. Therefore, I had to attribute a catar of the stomach. Ah, too many diseases in one person. The staff here is compassionate and drives me on vacation. Appearance, thin, pale, with a waxy pallor. I took a bath and at the same time weighed myself on the hospital scales. Last year I weighed 4 pounds, now 3 pounds 15 pounds. I was scared when I looked at the arrow, then it passed. There are incessant boils on the forearms, the same on the hips. I do not know how to prepare solutions sterically, besides, I injected three times with an unboiled syringe, I was in a hurry before the trip. This is unacceptable. January 18th. There was such a hallucination. I'm waiting for some pale people to appear in the black windows. It's unbearable. One curtain only. I took gauze from the hospital and hung it up. I couldn't think of an excuse. Oh, damn it. Why, after all, do I have to come up with an excuse for each of my actions? After all, indeed, this is torment, not life. Do I express my thoughts smoothly? Part 5 At dawn on February 14, 1918, in a distant small town, I read these notes by Sergei Polyakov. And here they are completely, without any changes whatsoever. I'm not a psychiatrist, I can't say for sure whether they are instructive or necessary, in my opinion, we need them. Now that ten years have passed, the pity and fear caused by the recordings are certainly gone. This is natural, but after rereading these notes, now that Polyakov's body has long decayed, and the memory of him has completely disappeared, I have retained interest in them. Maybe they are needed? I take the liberty to decide this in the affirmative. Anna K. died in 1922 from typhus and at the same site where she worked. Amneris, Polyakov's first wife, is abroad. And he won't come back. Can I print notes given to me? I can. I'm typing. Dr. Baumgard. 1927 Autumn. I moved it from a remote area to a county town. Bulgakov's delight in connection with moving to Vyazma, September 20, 1917, was not shared by T. N. Lapa, because all her thoughts were directed to one thing, her husband's illness. Here are the later memoirs recorded by L. Parshin shortly before her death, Vyazma is such a backwater city. They gave us a room there. As soon as they woke up, go look for a pharmacy. I went, found a pharmacy, brought it to him. It's over, it's necessary again. He used it very quickly. Well, he has a seal, go to another pharmacy, look for it. And so I was looking for it in Vyazma, somewhere on the edge of the city there is still some kind of pharmacy. 
I walked for almost three hours. And he's standing right on the street, waiting for me. He was so scary back then. Do you remember his picture before he died? That's the kind of face he had. He was so pathetic, so miserable. And he asked me one thing, just don't send me to the hospital. Lord, how much I persuaded him, admonished him, entertained him. I wanted to give up everything and leave. But when I look at him, what is he like? How am I going to leave him? Who needs him? Yes, it was a terrible streak. Parshin L. Decree. Op. Bulgakov, showing the keenest interest in political events in Russia, collected various newspapers telling about the upheavals of that time, starting with the February Revolution and the abdication of Nicholas II from the throne. Cherishing the idea of writing a grandiose historical novel about the amazing events in Russia, Bulgakov for a number of years attached the most interesting information to his collection. Unfortunately, he did not write this novel. Baumgard, so far no one has explained the origin of this mysterious name, although there have been attempts, see, Galinskaya I. L. Riddles of Famous Books. M. 1986. P. 101. A notebook of the type of general notebooks in black oilcloth. It should be noted that Bulgakov wrote the vast majority of his works in such general oilcloth notebooks, however, of different colors. Dozens of notebooks have absorbed the novels, The Master and Margarita, The Life of Mr. de Moliere, Notes of the Deceased, The Plays, Adam and Eve, The Cabal of the Saints, The Half-Witted Jordan, Bliss, Ivan Vasilyevich, Alexander Pushkin, Batum, Libretto, Minin and Pozharsky, Peter the Great, Rachel, etc. Several notebooks of the same work have, as a rule, a single author's numbering. Most often, notebooks contain not only the text of the work, but also materials for it, extracts, sketches, bibliography, drawings, diagrams, tables, etc. In general, Bulgakov's manuscripts are inferior in their external beauty only to the autographs of the great Dostoevsky. Undoubtedly, 1917. Dr. Baumgard. And she had to inject me with morphine. There are several versions of T.N. Lapp's memoirs, which were recorded in different years. There are also several records about Bulgakov's morphinism disease. Here is one of them. They brought a child with diphtheria, and Mikhail began to do a tracheotomy, and then Mikhail began to suck the films out of his throat and said, you know, it seems to me that the film got into his mouth. We need to get vaccinated. I warned him, look, your lips will swell, your face will swell, it will be terrible in your hands and feet. But he doesn't care to me, I'll do it. And after a while it started, the face swells, the body becomes covered with a rash, the itching is insane. And then terrible pains in the legs. I've experienced this twice. And he certainly couldn't stand it. Now, call Stepanida. She's coming. He, please bring me a syringe and morphine right now. She brought morphine, injected him. He immediately calmed down and fell asleep. And he really liked it. After a while, as he had an unimportant condition, he called the paramedic again. That's how it started. Parshin L. Decree. Op. After escaping from Moscow from the hospital, this is one of the mysterious records of Dr. Polyakov. No information about Bulgakov's stay in the Moscow hospital was found. It is only known that Bulgakov traveled to Moscow several times to get rid of military service. In February 1918, he succeeded. I survived the shooting and the coup in the hospital. This record is not confirmed by facts, but letters from Vyazma have been preserved, in which the Bulgakovs clearly expressed their attitude to the events taking place. On October 30, 1917, T. N. Lapa wrote to N. Zemskaya, Dear Nadyusha, please write immediately what is being done in Moscow. We live in complete obscurity, 
For four days, we have not received any news from anywhere. We are very worried, and the condition is terrible. On December 31st of the same year, Bulgakov wrote a detailed letter to Anne A. Zemskaya, in which he very clearly states his impressions of the two revolutions that took place in Russia. Here are these lines. Recently, on a trip to Moscow and Saratov, I had to see everything with my own eyes, and I would not like to see more. I have seen how grey crowds with whooping and vile swearing break windows on trains, I have seen how people are beaten. I saw destroyed and burnt houses in Moscow, stupid and brutal faces. I saw the crowds that besieged the entrances of captured and locked banks, hungry tales at the shops, hunted and pitiful officers, I saw newspaper leaflets where they write about essentially one thing, about the blood that flows in the South, in the West, and in the East, and about prisons. I saw everything with my own eyes and finally understood what happened. Many of Bulgakov's troubles stemmed from an extremely simple thing, he always correctly assessed what was happening. And such people in Russia are doomed to inevitable suffering. Loneliness is important, significant thoughts, calmness, wisdom, as we have already noted, Bulgakov told his friend A.P. Dushinsky about this in Kiev. And here's what Bulgakov wrote to Anne A. Zemskaya in the already mentioned New Year's Eve letter on December 31, 1917. I live all alone. But I have a wide field for reflection. And I'm thinking. And for ten miles around, no one. Fogs, swamps, forests. All this came to the writer's mind when completing work on the novel, The Master and Margarita, Gods, My Gods. How sad is the evening earth? How mysterious are the mists over the marshes? Anyone who wandered in these mists, who suffered a lot before death, who flew over this earth, carrying an unbearable load, knows this. A tired person knows this. And he leaves the mists of the earth, its swamps and rivers without regret, he gives himself with a light heart into the hands of death. It flies without touching the ground. CF with the story of a Chekhov, the black monk, references to which Bulgakov will make more than once in his writings. If you don't leave here, for the city, I'll strangle myself. Of course, you can't completely rely on memories, which are also recorded after 56 years, but the coincidences are still amazing. This is how T. N. Lapa remembered these tragic days. I didn't know what to do, I felt that it wouldn't end well. But he regularly demanded morphine. I cried, I asked him to stop, but he didn't pay attention to it. At the cost of incredible efforts, I forced him to leave for Kiev, otherwise, I said, would have to commit suicide. It affected him, and we went to Kiev. A. P.S. Entry Konchakovsky. I swore to her that I was leaving in mid-February. At the end of February, the Bulgakovs returned to Kiev. It was impossible to hide a serious illness from his mother and other close relatives. A real struggle with a deadly enemy, an incurable disease, has begun. Unfortunately, T. N. Lapa described this most important period in Bulgakov's life both vaguely and even ambiguously. The influence of interviewers is also possible. Here is her first memory in the recording of A. P. Konchakovsky, and then I turned to Ivan Pavlovich Voskresensky, the second husband of Varvara Mikhailovna, Bulgakov's mother, a doctor. V. L. For help. He advised Mikhail to inject distilled water. So, I did. I'm sure Mikhail understood what was going on, but he didn't show it and accepted the game. Gradually, he moved away from this terrible habit. And since then, not only have I never taken morphine again, but I have never talked about it. Her memoirs, later, recorded by L. K. Parshin, turned out to be more extensive, Varvara Mikhailovna immediately noticed, what is some kind of Mikhail? I told her he was sick and that's why we came. Ivan Pavlovich noticed it himself and asked somehow, what is it? Yes, I say, it happened that way. 
it is necessary, of course, to act. At first, I also went to pharmacies, to one, to another, tried to bring distilled water instead of morphine, so he threw this syringe at me. I stole the browning from him when he was sleeping, gave it to Coca and Vanka. And then I said, you know what, I'm going to the pharmacy more I won't walk. They wrote down your address. I lied to him, of course. And he was terribly afraid that they would come and take away his seal. I was terribly afraid of it. He wouldn't be able to practice then. He says, then bring me opium. It was then sold at the pharmacy without a prescription. He's the whole bubble at once. And then I suffered a lot with my stomach. And that's how he gradually realized that he could not use any more drugs. He knew it was incurable. That's how it gradually, gradually passed.